Warning, this episode contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. Hey guys, I'm Amanda. I'm Melissa, and this is Dark and Twisty. Dark and Twisties is a weekly crime and creepy podcast hosted by two best friends who uncover some of life's twisted moments. Bringing you a dark dose of serotonin and self-care sprinkled with a little humor, we run you through the facts all while dropping our unprofessional opinion. Follow us on Instagram at Dark and Twisties Podcast. Find us by searching Dark and Twisties on Spotify and Google Podcasts. And join us as we unravel our latest Dark and Twisty obsession. Wait, you've really never heard about this at all? No, not until, I mean, you said, told me what it was going to be about, but I didn't, like, look it up. But no, I've never even heard about it until you mentioned it the other day. This is going to be good. Oh, God. I've got all of my notes, and I have pictures for you. Ooh, I love pictures. Yeah, I made it pretty simple for you. In 1978, 36-year-old Sue Sharp separated from her husband, James, and moved her five kids from their Connecticut home to Northern California, where her brother Don lived. Arriving first at a rundown trailer inside of Quincy, California, Sue abruptly removed all of her family from the house and moved to Ketty about seven miles away because she had found out that her daughter, Tina, and one of Tina's friends had been molested by a man named David French, who lived in the neighborhood at the time. Gross. I don't know why people molest little kids anyways. Like, it's just, I don't get it. I don't either. People are disgusting. David was charged with lewd, and I don't know if I'm saying this right, lascivious. Lewd and lascivious, I think is what it's, how it's pronounced. I've never even heard that word, so, so we're basically just, just say like, it's right. Yeah, like, basically just, like, doing nasty shit. Oh, yeah. Okay. So he got charged with doing nasty shit (laughs) and moved (laughs) out of that area not too long after. The Ketty Resort, known for it being a low-income area with houses that were pretty close together, had cabins available. Cabin number 28 was a three-bedroom, one-bath cabin that would be occupied by her 15-year-old son, Johnny, taking the unfinished room in the basement. Rick and Greg, who was ages 10 and 5, sharing a room, leaving Sue, her daughter, Sheila, and Tina, ages 14 and 12, to share the last one. So the unfinished basement didn't have any access to the house on the inside. Johnny had to use an exterior door in order to get into the main house. They had, what is it, cereal box architects back then too. (laughs) Cereal box architects. (laughs) (laughs) They were so smart, they only made one exit. (laughs) (laughs) April 11th, 1981 would serve as any other day for the Sharp family. Sue, her daughter Sheila, sons Greg, and his friend Justin, who also lived in the Ketty cabins, headed up to Quincy to pick up Sue's other son, Rick, from his baseball tryouts and visit her friend Nina Meek. They met up with Johnny, who was Sue's oldest son, and his friend Dana, who was living in a foster home but spent most of his time in the Sharp residence. Sue was heading back to Ketty, so Johnny and Dana decided to go ahead and ride back with her. They arrived at Ketty around noon, and the boys completed some yard work, changed their clothes, and decided to hitchhike their way back to Quincy to stay with some friends until a party they were attending that evening. On the same evening, Sheila, Sue's oldest daughter, had plans to spend the night over at the Seabolt house, who lived just across the street from Cabin 28. While Justin was going to spend the night with Rick and Greg, Tina, who had been spending the day at the Seabolts, returned home around 9.30 p.m., and the boys were spotted in Quincy by multiple people and were said to have arrived home between the hours of 10 p.m. and midnight. Teddy to Quincy is only seven miles. So the boys, they had gone to school in Quincy, so most of their friends basically lived up in Quincy. So I guess it was really frequent that they would just catch rides from people. To be like, hey, you going to town? Can I bum a ride? On the morning of April 12th, 1981, Dila had plans to attend church with the Seabolts and headed back to her home around 7 a.m. to get changed. Upon opening the door to cabin 28, she made the gruesome discovery of three bodies covered in blood in her living room. Sheila frantically runs back where she informs Mrs. Seabolt to contact 911. James, Mrs. Seabolt's son, heads over to 28 trying to understand what happened, but he's also concerned about the fact that whoever committed these crimes could possibly still be in the house. 
So he makes his way around the outside of the house to the backyard and notices through a bedroom window, Rick, Greg, Justin, asleep and completely unharmed. Tapping on the window to wake the boys up, James motions them to come through the window and outside, not wanting them to see what had happened in the room next to them, and takes them back over to the seatbelts where they rejoined everybody else and waited for the police to arrive. Now, let me just say, homeboy is brave. Yeah, I wouldn't have uh, been going over to that house at all. Yeah, I wouldn't just be like, oh, I'm going to go see what happened. Let me go investigate around back. Like, no, I'm going to just go ahead and stay at home. I'm just going to go ahead and call the cops. Yeah. Too much brave. Too much brave, Too much brave. Dude. Too much brave. You're doing too much, guys. Yeah. And then, like, can we talk about the fact that these kids are just in that room, unharmed, asleep? That's really odd to me, like, that they're going to kill a bunch of people, but then leave the ones in the bedroom alone. Pretty sis. Don't add up, my friend. <laughs> it doesn't add up, my friend. <laughs> Around 8 a.m., the first officer arrives on scene and confirms the existence of three bodies covered in blood in the living room of cabin 28. While dispatching backup and emergency services, Sue's brother, Don, arrives and is questioned by police. During this interview, Don states that he didn't know who would want to hurt anybody that lived in this house, but wanted to make sure that police were aware of Sue's soon-to-be ex-husband, that he was often abusive towards her and the kids, and that they were going through kind of a tough divorce. He also mentioned that Sue's oldest daughter recently just moved into that cabinet after putting her daughter up for adoption and that the father of the child was Richard Meeks, Nina Meeks' son, and she was not happy about it because she wanted to be involved in that baby's life. So holy plot twist. She's 14 uh, yeah. and she's pregnant. She had to give up her child for adoption. Yeah, that's a little odd. Like, Sue already didn't have enough to deal with being a single mom, but, like, let's just throw on a grandchild. Right? From your 14-year-old daughter. Yeah, from your 14-year-old daughter. Oy vey. So officers began photographing the crime scene and collecting evidence at about 9.30. The doors and the windows had no indication of forced entry. On the inside of the living room, there were two bloodied knives one of which was a steak knife that was bent at a 30-degree angle, and a hammer that was found at the scene. The telephone was also taken off the hook, with the cord cut from the outlet, and the drapes were closed. Again, these murderers in the 70s were so... They were on top of their shit. They were. They were like, I get that I'm about to murder you, but, like, I don't want to make your floors dirty. And what's with steak knives? It's always steak knives. It's always a steak knife from the kitchen. So this is... Where we kind of get a little gruesome. Ooh. So just be prepared. I, I kind of am. The blood splatter evidence shows that most of the struggle occurred in the living room. Police found one shoe print on the outside of the home and various bloody prints throughout the house. Sue, who was discovered lying on her side, was near the sofa and nude from the waist down, but she was covered in a blanket. She was also gagged and bound by her own panties and a bandana that was secured with medical tape. She was stabbed multiple times in her chest, and her throat was slit, and the side of her head had an imprint of a BB pellet rifle. The other two victims, Johnny and Dana, were also bound with the medical tape and electric cords torn from various appliances found throughout the house. They both suffered blunt force trauma to their heads from the hammer, but Johnny had been stabbed with his throat slashed while Dana had been manually strangled. It wasn't until hours later that officers were notified that Sue's youngest daughter, Tina, hadn't been accounted for. They noticed that her shoes, her jacket, a toolbox containing various tools, and a shoebox school project that she was working on were also missing. At this point, Tina's whereabouts were unknown, and it was believed that she was abducted after the crimes were committed. I just feel like they should have noticed that she wasn't there. I feel like that should have been the first thing they noticed. In that situation, when you only have one other sister, you'd think that you would notice that they're not there. Her two younger brothers were unharmed in the one room, She now knows that her mother and her brother Johnny are both dead, and that the other body is Dana's body. Obviously, the dead bodies would have been the first thing I noticed, but I don't understand how they didn't immediately notice one was missing. Like, not only that, Sue's brother Don was down there. It's a weird vibe for me, bro. (laughs) Bad vibe. Bad vibe.
Cats and Crimes is a monthly true crime blog started by two cousins who decided that their passion of digging deeper into unsolved crimes and missing persons was better shared with others, covering cold cases, missing persons, active investigations, and causes of death that can't be explained. They help bring awareness to these sometimes forgotten crimes. You can check them out at www.catsandcrime.net or on Facebook and Instagram at Cats and Crime. So during the interviews, Sheila and the Seabolt family, who she was staying with the night before, said that they heard no commotion during the night. A couple who was living in cabin 16 mentioned they heard muffled screaming at around 1.15 a.m. that was loud enough to wake them up, but they heard nothing else the rest of the night. Victor, who was in cabin 23, says that his three cats were acting strange and they kept going in and outside. He had to get up from watching TV and let them in and out when normally they just sleep all night. A woman in cabin 18 said she didn't notice anything strange, but her dog was left outside and was barking at an abandoned area behind the Sharp residence before she finally let him in. James Siebel told police that he heard nothing during the night, but when he had arrived to see what happened, he noticed that the back door was open. When they asked if he had ever entered the home, he admitted to police that he went through the cabin quickly to see if there was anybody in the house, but there was no one in the kitchen, no one in the bathroom, no one in the east bedroom where Sue, Sheila, and Tina slept, and that he exited through the kitchen door, closing it behind him. Everybody says, no, I didn't notice anything. We got animals that are going fucking crazy. Why does nobody listen to that? Like your dog barking at a random empty lot? That's not weird to you? Right, because animals are typically the first ones who notice something weird. Yeah, like a dog barking continuously at an abandoned dark field. The couple, they heard a muffled scream at 1.15. So the scream was loud enough to wake them up, but they didn't feel like anything there wasn't a big deal to them. So you hear screaming, animals are going nuts. But let's just Just ignore it. Yeah, just a no- just another normal night. Just a normal night out here. You know, th- my dog doesn't normally do this, but it- it's normal. It's okay. I'm sorry. He's not usually like this. <laughs> I don't think anything's wrong. He's just, <laughs> he's just being weird, but nothing's wrong. Yeah, nothing's wrong. There's definitely not a murder happening next door. There's definitely not a murderer in that field back there, for sure. People are so dumb. I hate it. I literally, I hate people and I will always hate people for reasons like this. Like, listen to the animals. They live out in the wild. Like, they know when danger is happening. Right. They have to have that instinct. Listen to the dog that's barking at the empty field. (laughs) So here's where it goes cray cray. While interviewing, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> While interviewing the three boys found unharmed, Rick and Greg had no recollection of anything that happened in the night besides going to sleep and being woken up by James to climb out a window. Justin, on the other hand, in an interview with his mother Marilyn inside of a police car, tells them that the female body in the house is Sue's and that Tina is missing and they need to look down by the river. In a later interview at the station, it was revealed that Justin told his mom he had a dream that he was hearing noises in the living room, and when he got up to look and see what was going on, he saw two men talking to Sue and Johnny and Dana walking in the door and starting to argue with them. Tina had come out of her bedroom, but was quickly taken out by one of the men. He also states that in this dream, he tried to stop Sue's bleeding with towels and covered her with a blanket. In a later interview done under hypnosis, Justin was able to detail both of the men in his dream as being in their late 20s, early 30s. One of them was taller with dark blonde hair and the other was shorter with dark black hair. He says that the two men were wearing gold frame glasses and one of them had a mustache and the other one was clean shaved. Two suspect sketches were then released to the public. So under hypnosis, this kid was like, this is what they look like. This is all what happened. He's over here telling his mom, I had this really weird dream. Now, I have really weird dreams too, bro. Not about yeah. that. No. <laughs> when I wake up in the morning, there's not people dead. I don't right. have dreams like, like that. I have some very odd dreams too, but I don't I don't wake up to dead bodies usually. Well, usually. I'm not gonna say usually. It's 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 never. It's never happened. Off the record though. <laughs> Hello, FBI. This is a joke. Any of the three letter organizations that are listening right now. I was just joking. 
Imagine, though, like, having to be put under hypnosis in order to tell, like, details of a murder that happened that you saw, but you don't remember. Put me under, Doc. No, I couldn't imagine that. So two men quickly became the prime suspects in this case. Martin Smart, who was Justin's father, and his friend John Bo Bobity. I'm going to say that wrong every single time. Yeah, John Bo Bobity. That's an interesting name. Martin and John Bo Bobity, who we are just going to refer to as Bo, had met during their most recent stay at a VA mental institution on issues possibly related to PTSD. Forming a quick bond with Bo, Martin offered him a place to stay. After being released, both men were required to visit with the therapist from the VA office in order to maintain living outside of the hospital. Bo, who had a pretty rough criminal history including theft, organized crime, and connections to the mob was pretty adamant about finding himself a woman to spend time with while he stayed at the Ketty Resort. I don't know about you, but I feel like the mental institution is the wrong place to look for a roommate. Usually, I mean, maybe if you're both crazy, it's not crazy, but like it is a little crazy. Just meeting somebody in a mental institution a couple weeks ago, being like, you know what, I like you so much that so you should come stay on my couch. I don't think I could ever invite my uh, mental institution buddy to be my actual house buddy. Hey, roomie, want to be permanent roomies? <laughs> Bo was pretty adamant about finding himself somebody to stay with while he was at the Ketty Resort. Running into Sue Sharp one day, he made it very obvious to the Smart family that he wanted to get to know Sue better. Not only was Sue a single mother, but she was also becoming really close friends with Marilyn Smart, who was Justin's mother. Marilyn had been confiding in Sue about some of the abuse she was receiving from Marty and her plans to get a divorce. Upon finding out about this new friendship, Marty was furious and no longer wanted his family to be involved with the Sharps, stating how he particularly disliked Sue's oldest son, Johnny, and threatened to break his hand. It's not nice. I just want to point out that I don't like Bo. He gives me the heebies. Like, I just want to find a woman. I just want to find a woman. You just got out of the loony bin. Yeah. I don't think a woman should be first on your radar. Just getting out of the loony bin. Being less loony should be the first thing. And then maybe a woman. (laughs) Yeah, serious now. This is murder. This is not funny. Right. It's not funny at all. Goddamn. Why are you laughing? (laughs) Murder is not a joke. Identity theft is not a joke. Identity theft is not a joke, Jim. (laughs) Murder is not a joke, Bo. Nothing funny about this, Bo. During Marty's interrogation, he was obsessively detailing a hammer that was stolen from him recently after asking police if the rumors of a knife and a hammer were found at the crime scene. When he was asked of his whereabouts, he states that he, his wife Marilyn, and Bo were down at the Ketty Backdoor Bar and that the staff there would be able to confirm it. Police asked him if he noticed anything strange when he was walking to the bar past the Sharp residence, and he states he didn't see anything strange, but it was definitely much darker than it usually was in that area. He told officers- A.K.A. something strange. (laughs) Yeah, A.K.A. something creepy's going on. Something little sus is happening. (laughs) That's what I would consider strange, but- Uh, Their definitions of strange, they're just like, no, it's fine. (laughs) Not a big deal. (laughs) Just a normal day in the neighborhood, guys. A fucking pack of cats over here is losing their shit, but it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's a motherfucking pack of cats. Do this shit all the time. (laughs) Like, I don't understand. I see no connection, sir. He also told officers that he stayed at the bar until just about closing and then headed back to the cabin to go to bed. When asked if Bo was also in the residence all night long, he told police that Bo was asleep on the couch when he went out there for his morning routine of putting wood into the fireplace before heading back to bed. That morning, he received a call from his friend Dee, who needed to get something from a vehicle that Marty was borrowing from him, and that Justin had arrived that morning after James Seabolt got him out of the house and sent him home and told his family, they're all dead, someone killed him. This is a nice way to say it. You're like, hey, mom, I'm back from my sleepover. They're all dead, by the way. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> for letting me sleep over, but they're all dead now. <laughs> Super cool sleepover, bro. During Marilyn's interview, she states that Marty and Bo mentioned inviting Sue with them to the bar in hopes that her and Bo would hit it off, suggesting that Marilyn should go over and see if she wanted to come. Both Bo and Marty had dressed up in their best three-piece suits for the occasion with some sunglasses, but Marilyn was unsuccessful in her attempts at getting Sue to join them, 
So instead, the three of them went down to the bar in hopes of Bo finding somebody there. While they were at the backdoor bar, Marilyn tells police that the owner decided to switch the music from country to rock, and that both Marty and Bo were furious about this, to the point of where they headed back home. Once arriving home, they called the bar to complain about the music change. Letting the manager know that they didn't like it, Marty decided that he wanted to head back to the bar and finish drinking, but Bo said, Just a minute. I'm too mad. Boy, the way I feel, I'd like to kill somebody. Marilyn states that she stayed behind once they left again and headed to bed. She couldn't remember what time that they came home, but she stated that she woke up in the early hours of the morning and saw both men standing at the fireplace burning something. She woke up by Justin coming home and talking about what had happened at the Sharp household. So she didn't find the sketch at all? No, two dudes hanging out at a fireplace? You don't wake up and see that all the time? <laughs> well. <laughs> that's, that's not <laughs> your normal, like... <laughs> Oh, hey, <laughs> what you doing over there? Oh, fireplace time? Got you. Yeah, no, she didn't think that was that was weird at all. They got so mad that they had to leave the bar, but then they went and called the bar to complain instead of just complaining while they were at the bar. Yeah. And then homie said he wanted to kill somebody because he was so mad. And then she wakes up to them doing a seance at the fireplace and just falls back <laughs> asleep. Yeah, she's just like, whatever. <laughs> whatever she said, happens, oh. happens. <laughs> Oh, seance time, going back to sleep. Which <laughs> That's such an odd reaction to a music change. <laughs> Rock is disgusting. Somebody's going to die for this. Like, it's not how it works, broski. It's just odd. These are odd people. Right? Like, cereal box architects, cereal box cops, and now we got cereal box whatever they may be. Yeah, cereal box seances. I love cereal box seances. Been Maybe they were trying to contact a serial killer. Dun, dun, dun. But I'm t- Police spent months looking for Tina, suggesting that she was present during the murders and was removed by suspects. But due to lack of evidence, the investigation on Tina's whereabouts goes cold. The police also investigated Tina's teacher at Quincy Elementary. He had a strange fixation with Tina and had her photo on his desk at work and at home. While the teacher had an alibi, the police were right about their suspicions about him. He was later arrested for child abuse in a different state. Why do you have pictures of your student not only on your desk, but at home? That's kind of, ew. I don't, ew. That's why. I just, which is why though. Having like a group photo, like, okay. But apparently this was just a photo of just Tina. Right. Like, if you had a photo of, like, your class, fine. Maybe a little weird that you have it at home. But a picture of just one little girl? Yep. Ew. But they were right to be suspicious about him because he was later arrested for child abuse. So he was doing something creepy. Well, yeah. He was multiple creepy things, yes. Yeah, multiple creepy things. I wouldn't be taking pictures of my students and bringing them home being like, this looks like a picture for the fridge. Right. That's like maybe if you brought like a drawing home from them, but like their picture. Yeah, I feel like a drawing would be a little more. That's that's a little bit more. Yeah, that's understandable. But you bring in a picture of a child that is not your child home. Weird. So during the investigation, at one point, the Department of Justice sent out two investigators from their organized crime unit, but they conducted their investigation and gave the case back to the county. While still having no solid evidence and Marty passing a lie detector test, the investigations into the murder of Sue, Johnny, and Dana also went cold. I don't understand why they had the DOJ come out there in the organized crime unit, because this was a homicide. Now, earlier, if you remember, heebie-jeebie Bo had a pretty strange criminal history. They think that because he was, like, involved in a lot of weird stuff, that instead of instead of sending out homicide, the DOJ would send out this organized crime unit, and they would be able to look at it as a whole. But unfortunately, they only looked at Bo. So they finished up their investigation and they went on their way. That's interesting. It's pretty cool. It's like really good cop work, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's better than the uh, cereal box cops. So at this point, the murders of Sue, Johnny, and Dana are cold. And Tina is still missing. It wasn't until three years later, 
on April 22nd of 1984 that a man by the name of Ronald stumbled upon a human skull while searching for cans in the woods about 90 miles from Ketty. When officers arrived at the scene, they also found a pair of jeans with a missing back pocket, a blue jacket, a blanket, and an empty surgical tape dispenser near the scene. As the discovery of the human skull is made public, police received a strange anonymous call stating that the remains could possibly belong to Tina. Unwilling to give their identity, the caller states, I was watching the news and they were talking about a girl found at Feather Falls. I was just wondering if you thought about the murder up in Ketty, you know, in Palumas County a couple years ago where a 12-year-old girl was never found. After the skull was identified as being Tina's, the investigation quickly went from a missing person to a homicide. Though this call was never fully looked at, the investigation into the Ketty murders was reopened. During this second investigation, police were able to come up with more solid information on what might have happened on April 11th. Of all the people that like go missing, like they hadn't even identified it yet. And they received and it that was, call. <laughs> and it was three years later, too. So it's not like it was like a brand new case. Yeah, it wasn't fresh still where everyone's still like, oh my gosh, you just found a skull. It has to be hers. Three years yeah. later, you're like, man, I was just thinking about that, too. It's so crazy that you found her skull. I was literally just thinking about that today, and then, bam, you found the skull, and I was like, ooh, that's <laughs> ooh. her for sure. <laughs> that looks like a 12-year-old little girl. That definitely called, that call was somebody who knew that it was for sure her skull. That's weird. They started this second investigation so that way they can get more information about what had happened. Since Marty and Bo were released from the mental institution, they were both required to visit a therapist from the VA. During some of these sessions, Marty's therapist stated that he would constantly complain about his marriage and how it was falling apart and how he needed help controlling his anger and his, quote, woman skills. Whatever the heck that means. <laughs> my woman skills. I need to get control of my woman skills. God, I'm going to go to a therapist and be like, sir, I need help with my man skills. <laughs> yeah, I need help in the man department. I want man skills. I don't know what woman skills are. Maybe like talking to a woman, but I don't know. If you have anger issues, your marriage is falling apart, and you can't control your anger, like I don't think it's your woman skills. I think you're just a shit person. Right. And I also kind of think that if you were married to someone that long, then like your skills with your wife would be, you would know how to talk to your own wife. So during these sessions, he also stated that he believes that he suffered from PTSD as a result of being in the service during Vietnam. While never seeing any actual combat during his time there, he said that he would often stay awake at night with the thought of what might happen to him. Later changing his story to having an easy tour and never fearing fearful, which left his therapist unable to diagnose him with PTSD. Because let's just face it, you can't have PTSD from the thought of being in combat. Like, no. PTSD is post the traumatic event. Yeah, it's not pre-traumatic event. <laughs> yeah. It's post-traumatic event. During the last session before the murders, it was made known that Marty had called a friend and stated that if he didn't get things straightened out, he would have to kill someone. When asked about the meaning behind that, he had no response. Witnesses would later state that Marty was always erratic and threatening someone. Marilyn, his wife, even confessed that one time Marty tried to run her and Justin over during one of his episodes. It wasn't until two weeks after the murders that Marty is asked by his therapist what's really bothering him and to finally tell the truth. He replied with, I killed the woman and the daughter, but I didn't have anything to do with the boys. Aware of the events that had happened in Ketty, his therapist asked him what caused him to commit such a horrible crime. Marty stated that Sue was responsible for Marilyn wanting a divorce. Marilyn had been telling her things that were going on, and Sue was giving her information on how to achieve the divorce and get away from him. He said he had to kill Tina because she witnessed the attack on Sue and the boys, and he couldn't have any witnesses. When asked why Tina didn't run away when she first witnessed what was going on, he said that he incapacitated her. His therapist explaining that he needed to turn himself in and he didn't understand how he was able to pass a polygraph test if he committed these murders. 
Marty just smiled and said, those things are easy to beat. I was lying and they let me go. So while interrogating Marilyn about the behaviors around the time of the murders, Marilyn states that the day the bodies were removed from the cabin, she called Wade Meeks, which was Nina Meeks' other son, and asked if she and the kids could come and stay with them because she was concerned for her safety. While Marilyn was packing up, Marty had taken the vehicle that Dee let him borrow previously before the murders and headed to Reno with Bo for an appointment. Arriving the next day at the Meeks residence where Marilyn was staying, she said Marty was acting strange and kept stating he needed to go back to Ketty to finish something that he started. He was pacing around and seemed to have been on something, so he was asked to leave, where he headed back over to the cabins at Ketty Resort. Bo, however, headed to Klamath Falls, Oregon. D Lakes is also investigated during this time and tells police that he doesn't believe that Marty and Bo went to Reno that day. He thinks they drove up to Feather Falls and that it was possible that Tina had been in the car with them. Marilyn files for the divorce from Marty and decides to stay with the Meeks family until she can secure a place of her own. So he lets him borrow this car a couple days before the murders. And now... Yeah. In the second investigation, he's like, look, I don't think they actually went to uh, Reno for an appointment. I think they went somewhere else and they had a kid in the car. Like, that's kind of important information. Like, you should have told somebody earlier. Right. You should have told somebody about that, like, way before. Why would you just now bring it up? If you think they had a child who was missing, you thought that at any point. You should have said something. Right. Actually, a child whose uh, family just got murdered that like this is a small town so if he was acting like super shady during all this time he was telling police that he mysteriously had this detailed hammer stolen from him weeks before the murder people are talking about he's erratic he does crazy things he threatened parts of this family you know he didn't want them to be anywhere near his family nobody apparently thought that this was like important a lot of them don't think anything is strange at all so maybe they were just like oh yeah it's weird but it's also not weird it's normal behavior he's acting weird but like i guess it's normal yeah maybe he was just always (laughs) weird so it just wasn't out of character but still like you always kind of suspect the weird one you're like could have been him Unable to reach Marilyn by phone, Marty decides to write her a letter on April 28th, 17 days after the murders, hoping to win her back. In this letter, he states, I've paid the price of your love, and now I've bought it with four people's lives. With no response from Marilyn, he told his therapist that if Marilyn hadn't come back to him by the following Friday, he would start killing her boyfriends and people involved with her and that he would disappear if he doesn't hear from her and he might not show back up for a couple years. Marty also stated he was no longer staying in the cabin, but at a hotel in Klamath Falls. In the beginning of May, Marty headed back to his therapist with no appointment to say goodbye and that he was moving for his new job. So, super bipolar, I love you, I killed for you. If you don't answer me, I'm going to kill you by I'm moving. Right. <laughs> I just like... <laughs> feel like the escalation just didn't have too much of a pattern. It just was no. like, hey, boom. <laughs> I love you, please come back to me. If you don't, I'm going to kill somebody. Oh, I hate you. Okay, bye, I'm moving. Okay, bye, I'm moving. Like, not a big deal anymore. Remember when I was pissed off about that? Totally forgotten. Water under the bridge. It's totally fine. Totally fine. I'm, I know I was so mad that I said I was going to kill people, but like, I'm fine now. It's okay. Don't worry about it. So in August of 1991, Dee, his wife, receives a card from Marty in the mail stating that Bo had died and to let Marilyn know. Marty's whereabouts are unknown from the end of 81 until 1987, where he is then checked into another psychiatric hospital. In 1994, he files for Social Security claiming PTSD, but was denied due to the fact that a previous therapist had debunked that theory that he had PTSD even though he never saw combat. Over the years, he continued to file for Social Security and is still denied access, ultimately dying from cancer with the possibility of it being AIDS-related in the 2000s. Oh, Marty. So now, so now we have the two main suspects dead. Oh, wait, so... <laughs> they did. <laughs> Who are we going to turn to now? So now that See? the prime suspects in the case had passed away, police figured their investigation was over. The anonymous call recording of the person who contacted police after Tina's skull was found was later found in an unidentified evidence box not linked to the Ketty murders. 
even though it was re-examined by police, they were unable to identify the caller. During the reinvestigation, they were also told about a high school counselor at the Quincy High who received an anonymous letter from a student saying, Dear Miss R, I was told who did it and he said he was having family problems and that the creditors were after him. They also said that they hypnotized his boy and he says he saw everything. He said it was Marty Smart because he was having an affair with Mrs. Sharp. Marty likes to see people being killed, and he also likes to kill cats and dogs. By Anonymous. P.S. They said he's an organ. This letter was never investigated the first time, and still to this day does not have an owner. The previous bloody fingerprints found in various locations of the house were never identified, along with the one solid shoe print that was found outside. So great police work. They got a call from someone that put exactly what they needed to find out who this bull was. But they were like, let me put it over here in this box. It's not connected to it for safekeeping. Best cops they were. They really are. Like, this is a super sketchy phone call, but like, nah, we just gonna put it in the corner. Yeah, not a big deal. We don't need it. They told us about (laughs) who the skull belonged to before we even knew who it belonged to. That's not important. It's not important at all. That We're not really worried about this phone call. It's very irrelevant. (laughs) Has nothing to do with the murders at all. (laughs) It's the irrelevancy for me. Like, I just don't get it. They were calling about the child that was missing from said murders, and then they were just like, nope, let's just put it in another box. It's cool. We're just going to put it in the box marked irrelevant. We don't need it. I don't. And then the note basically saying, by the way, Marty did it. That's some grade A police work. It's better. Oh, God. There's more. There's more. Oh, no. (laughs) Police also stumble upon a statement from a witness by the name of Philip. Philip was at the Feather River College in a fairly intoxicated state. At about 9 p.m., Wade Meeks gave him a ride to the Methodist Church. He hung out there for a little bit of time before he decided to go over to the Mini Mart. While he was at the Mini Mart, he met up with Johnny and Dana. They were getting a ride from three people in a pickup. The pickup was described as a 1954 to 1957 Chevy. He said one of the men in the car was Martin Smart. Phillips did not know who the other two men were. After arriving in Ketty, Phillips said that while he was looking through a window of the Sharp residence, he saw Johnny get his throat cut, Dana get hit over the head with a hammer, and Sue being choked. Philip said that at one point, he ran to the Ketty back door bar where he saw a man that was locking up the bar and tried to tell him what was happening, but the man just got into a blue car that looked like a Mercedes and drove away. Philip then returned to the Sharp residence to try and help Tina. At one time, he was hiding under the house and he even scratched the license plate number from the pickup onto the hot water heater. So now they have a witness. He was drunk, but he was still able to recount good information. He recounted every detail. He knew, uh, uh, Yep. what is happening? He was apparently hiding under that house, and he was caught by, you know, Marty and the other two men, in which they put him in the vehicle, but he was able to get away. Oh, my nope. God. Scratched into the water heater, the license plate of said vehicle. I honestly did not think it could get any worse past, like, the phone call and the note. And then it got worse. So now they have a witness statement. They have the license plate of said person. Even though Marty and Bo are, you know, passed on, figuring out what happened should still be important. Just piece it together. Like, if you fucked up, you fucked up. It's fine. Right. Like, we all know you fucked up at this point, but, like, let's move past that. Let's just piece it together and be like, okay, so this is what's happening. This is what went on. It's the most you can do at this point. But, no, they were just like, oh, shit, a witness? Damn it. Gotta get rid of Damn this, it. too. <laughs> Gotta How get did rid we of miss that? We gotta yeah. go put that in the irrelevant box, too. Shit. <laughs> just drop that in the irrelevant box. Boop. We're just gonna file that I for irrelevant. In 2006, Justin does another round of hypnosis where he again names Marty and Bo as the murderers. He was able to recount all of the same information that he had previously done a few weeks after the murders and states that he saw Bo standing over the bodies. In 2010, Marty's therapist is again interviewed about Marty's confession, where his confession is mentioned in full detail. 
To this day, the murders of Sue, Johnny, Dana, and Tina have never been solved. Marty Smart and Bo Bobadine still remain the prime suspects in this case, but due to lack of evidence and their passing, no formal charges will ever exist. The Ketty Resort was condemned in 1995, leaving only a few buildings still standing. One of those buildings being Cabin 28, but it was only standing until 2016 when it was finally demolished. So I feel like I can solve this case now. Couch detective time. Hebe Bo. I'm suspecting it may have been Marty and Bo. There's just a little bit of an inclination that it could have possibly been him. I feel like you didn't even need to add possibly into that sentence. Yeah. So like there was like things that marty said during his investigations and one of them when talking about justin being in the house of the murders marty stated it's possible that justin might have been able to move around without me noticing so he basically put himself at the scene of the crime stating that (laughs) he was there And that it's possible his son was able to move around in the house without him noticing. Because he even till this day, even Marilyn says the same thing. She didn't know where Justin was that night. He stayed at random people's houses all the time. So it just wasn't that big of a deal. So, So what he did was implemented himself in the murder by saying what he said. And yet the cops were still like, oh, okay, cool fact. Go home and think about it. We'll get back to you. I don't understand. There's a few theories that go around about the possible reasons for this. The first one is the fact that Marty and Sue were having an affair because it was confirmed by multiple people in the later investigations and that Marilyn was jealous after she had been confiding in Sue about their marriage and everything that was going on. In efforts to win her back, Sue had to be killed. Johnny and Dana weren't a part of the plan. And Justin's parents didn't seem to really care about the whereabouts of their son because he was in the house also. The only reason that Johnny and Dana died was because they fought in protection of Sue and Tina. And Tina was killed because she saw everything. The two boys, however, stayed asleep the entire time. And Marty knew that he could keep Justin quiet. That's sad. Yeah, so little girl only died because she couldn't be a witness. Sheila didn't die because she was over at the Siebel. Greg and Ricky didn't die because they were in the room with Justin and they stayed asleep, thankfully. Mm, That's so sad. The other theory is that Nina Meeks, who was Richard's mother and that's Sue's friend, so Sheila's baby daddy, so that makes her that child's grandmother. She was not Mm -hmm. happy with the fact that Sue made Sheila get rid of her grandbaby when she had stated multiple times that she wanted to be a part of that child's life. Sheila possibly had also wanted to keep that baby, but because Sue forced her to put that child up for adoption, she didn't give the Meeks the chance to help raise the child either. So together, they came up with a plan to get rid of Sue. I mean, I feel like both of those are plausible, but I feel like I believe the Marty one a little bit more since so many people said, like, it was Marty. It had to have been Marty and Sue having an affair. Yeah, and then Bo was pissed off that she didn't want anything to do with him. Well, he was a hebe, so I mean, it's understandable. But he just wanted love, and Sue didn't want to give him love. He just wanted to be loved. He just wanted himself a woman. In the Discord that I'm sending Mm -hmm. is the police sketches that were made up from Justin being put under hypnosis. Can I guess which one is (laughs) Bo? Yeah, go ahead and guess. It's the long-haired one, isn't it? No. Oh, but he's the one that gives me the heebies. Oh, nope. That's going to be Marty right here. Oh, well, shit. Marty, you give me the heebies, too. Yeah, give me the heebies, too. And this is Bo. Oh, okay, yeah. Bo gives me even worse heebies. So in that mugshot, though, or the drawing, they're wearing glasses. Mm-hmm. So in Justin's details of his dream, He says that in his dream, these two men were wearing glasses. But then when he goes under hypnosis, he's able to recall the fact that they were sunglasses and that they had like a gold trim on them. Ooh, because I remember they went to the bar wearing their 
Best three-piece suits and sunglasses. Mm -hmm. So people in the bar later on were able to confirm that, yeah, those those sunglasses that they were wearing were sunglasses and they were gold-plated sunglasses. Because they had dressed up almost like extravagant that night. They stood out. They were wearing three-piece suits that were just outrageous for hole-in-the-wall bar. They were they were the men in black. They were the men in black. Here comes the men in black. <laughs> Some say that because of all the issues that were happening between the two families, that this was basically premeditated and that Bo and Marty made sure that their outfits were extravagant and that they made quite a fuss at the bar so that when anybody asked, were they at the bar that night? Their alibi would be tight. Yeah, that makes sense because that way they can sit there and be like, oh yeah, they were definitely there that night because they were wearing this weird shit. And if you think about it, they said that they went to the bar and then they went home and then they went to the bar again and then they came home. That's four then, times that they had to pass by the Sharp household. Right. And then they went and did their seance. Yeah, and then they went and did their seance. So Marilyn, in one of her later interviews, states that the police asked about the outfits that they were wearing. She said that they were two of Marty's suits he had used just for special occasions. And that after the night of the murders and the night of the fireplace seance, those suits were never seen of again. Oh, he burned them in the fireplace. He burned them in the fireplace, probably. Oh, y'all looking even more guilty. You <laughs> looking dumb. Y'all you looking, looking stupid. Y'all looking so dumb right now. So this was the knife that was found. And oh, that geez, is that is knife. bent. Yeah, so it was bent because they stabbed so hard. They bent it. That they bent it. So, like, kind of ragey. Yeah, like, that's somebody who was pissed. Yeah, they were pissed about something. That wasn't just a, oh, we broke in and we did a home invasion. Which, by the way, the movie The Strangers is based off of this. Not fully, but loosely. Oh, shit. I love that movie. Yeah, this movie is based off of it. Just of a cabin in, you know, a remote wooded area where a family is the victims of a home invasion. That knife getting bent that much, that was somebody who was so pissed off that they felt like they had to, like, brutally hurt somebody. Yeah, they had to do some damage. And I mean, a fucking steak knife. It's always the steak knives. It's, it's always. always. I in swear. In the 1970s, they didn't have anything but steak knives to kill people it, with, apparently. Steak knives and pieces of wood from under the bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bed bed frame wood. All we need in this situation and a steak knife. See, I have a set of steak knives on my counter. And hmm. I think the worst part about it is, is it's got a sharpener, too. So, like, they can sharpen said steak knife. It's like my worst nightmare. Also, between the time that the murders happened and Tina's skull was found, a man had found a hammer inside of a Keddie pond. He discovered it while he was treasure hunting with his metal detector. Not thinking anything of it, he threw it back into the lake. Later on, the man was reading about the murders online, and he found out that the killers had used two hammers in the murders, and one was still missing. As he alerted police, they went out to the pond, and they were able to find the hammer. It just so happens that it exactly matched Marty's obsessive description of the one that he had missing back in 1981. At this point, <laughs> your, your main suspects are dead. All it's doing is they're just continuing to pile evidence on top of their grave. This poor little police station is just like, we can't handle it. It's too much for us. We weren't trained in this. Like, so just brush it We didn't get to the end of the cereal box. Yeah, they just brush it We haven't received our certification yet. Dude finds a hammer while he's treasure hunting. It's just like, (laughs) throw it back in the pond. It's fine. Thank you for just rewashing everything off of there that we needed. Appreciate it, the bro. D- you just rewash the DNA. It's fine. We're yeah. just going to put it in the relevant box anyway. Yeah. Just file that also for I for relevant. We don't need it. I for relevant. That should be the name of this episode. I for relevant. <laughs> yeah, because we basically just threw everything in that box. 
these cops said, oh, you got a witness? Irrelevant. Like, Murder weapon? Irrelevant. Somebody got hypnotized and told you exactly who did it? Irrelevant. Uh-huh. Anonymous letter from a student at a school detailing everything that happened? Irrelevant. The fact that Marilyn saw Marty and Bo burning what possibly could have been the clothing that they were wearing with blood all over it? Irrelevant. Like, that definitely doesn't have anything to do with the fact that people were murdered. <laughs> Marty confesses to his therapist. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. Everything in this case, those cops just saw it and were like, nope, that's, that definitely doesn't mean anything for sure. Justin even told them in the beginning, he was in the, he was in the cop car with his mom being investigated and he said, go check the lake. The lake had the hammer. So it's like, Ooh. they could have... They had so much information during this whole thing, and they were just like, you know, nah. Right. They had so much of the information, and then they basically just said, oh, no, it's okay. We don't. That information, no, we don't need it. We don't want it. It's We don't like it. I was reading that people, so for a while, like, they kept the Cabin 28 up because it was bringing people to their town so you know their restaurants or their gas stations and stuff like that were making more money because of this crime that happened so yeah when they condemned the whole area they kept i think it was i think they said it was like four or five different buildings up and one of them was 28 because it was almost like a tourist attraction well they ended up having to go ahead and demolish it because of the fact that so many people were then like it wasn't just to look at anymore. They started, like, trying to get in the house. And people were calling, saying, like, you know, there's someone breaking in over there. I heard screaming. People were reporting seeing ghosts, lights turning on and off, you know, animals just acting super weird when they pass by the property to the point where they're just like, okay, this has escalated too far now. We need to just go ahead and get rid of this. Right. Just, like, take it down. Take it down a notch. I was just, I always think it's a little weird that places where people are brutally murder turn into like these big tourist attractions. Like, I, yeah. I sometimes think that's weird. Yeah, it's really strange. I just, I don't know if that's somewhere I would want to go and like visit and be like, oh yeah, this is such a cool vacation. <laughs> My next vacation isn't going to be Disneyland, it's going to be the Ketty Resort in California. And that is the Ketty Cabin Murders. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Dark and Twisties Podcast. And find us by searching Dark and Twisties on Spotify and Google Podcasts. We now have a website you can check out at www.darkandtwisties.com. Bye! You didn't buy with me. I said bye. Oh, I didn't hear you. Oh, I said bye. We have to do it again, the bye. Oh, are we saying it at the same time? Um, yeah, kind of, I guess. Are you going to count it down? <laughs> yeah, I'll count it. Ready? Okay. <laughs> Three, two, one. Bye. Bye. <laughs> That's the best thing ever. Oh, that shall work. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.